So I guess we can go to the next slide. All right, hold on. Okay, this slide is taken from from the intro to gridded aviation part one that Brian sent out a few days ago with the invitation to the conference call. Um, I'm not going through all of those slides because you have them, but I just wanted to highlight a few key points. Um, you know, when when you're approaching digital aviation services or gridded aviation to your office, some of you may encounter um, hesitancy from your forecasters, and I we're just trying to arm you with some some tools, some ideas to help mitigate some of the concerns of your fellow forecasters. The big motivation behind digital aviation services is just that, just basically so that we can have some consistency. Um, we already do the public grids, marine grids, fire weather grids, why can't we do aviation grids? Let's just take it one step further. We're really good at GFE, so we, we can expand our services. This does go up to the headquarters level into the next gen requirements and it fits into the big picture. Um, and then on the smaller scale, it ties in with the efforts of enhanced short term forecasting. What will help in the, in the long run, once, once everyone's on board and we're talking, I don't know, two to five years down the line or more, I, I'm not sure, but when when this when all the offices are doing the aviation grids, think of think of what that can do for our customers on a big picture basis. Even the aviation weather center would be able to use our products even better rather than they, they just click around and look at all of our tasks. Wouldn't it be nice if they could see one big picture of what we're thinking? So that's the big picture. I'd like to try to break it down for you because it does seem like a daunting task to do aviation grids. Um, one more motivational thing is, besides you know the customers, a lot of our customers are already trying to find aviation grids from other sources, specifically the HER model. I've heard a lot about, you know, the FAA is kind of bought into the HER. Well, I look at the HER model daily and I don't usually like everything it says. So I don't know about you, but I like to make some modifications and hopefully turn what it's saying for ceiling grids into what I would think is better. So we, the forecasters, we can add value and it's, it's not actually that much more workload. You know, the, the big thing though is if, if we're going to do this as a country, you know, the all the county warning areas side by side, we should probably try to do this the right way. Um, one way we've been doing this, like in the extended, is starting with a common, a common ground, the super blend now. So what Jerry did was he made a consensus of all the short-term models for ceiling heights and, pre and uh, visibilities, and he added that into our GFE suite of products. So in the future, we would be able to um, do ISC checks with each other and, and make sure we line up. But we could all start with one common model, con short, and um, just kind of edit from there. I'll, I'll go into the presentation a little bit more about why, why you might want to make changes to con short or why it's good. Um, Jerry created this match to analysis capability, um, at least that's what we call it at our office. Normally, or all this is, is that you pull in the observations from the past several hours and you populate them right into GFE. Then you can interpolate, you, you delete the first couple hours and you interpolate into the forecast. Um, that's been, that's proven to be really useful for these aviation grids. All right, Jerry. So I guess we've talked about Consort a little bit, and I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with it. It's been around for about two years. But just to give a little bit of a review, um, 
it, what it, the idea behind ConShort is that it will blend the observations with a short-term model blend. Um, this that's mainly important with elements such as temperature, dew point, wind, wind gusts. Um, but the idea is that it'll, for about those first six hours, it's going to blend what is currently happening in with what the models are saying. Um, ConShort will run at about 50 after the hour, and it produces hourly guidance out to about 24 hours. And you can see the elements that are listed here. Um, pretty much all the elements that we care about um, in the forecast. Uh, so the new elements that have just added um, in the last few months are the uh, predominant ceiling height, the predominant visby, low-level wind shear, and low-level wind shear height. Um, so after about 24 hours, I've also allowed uh, those elements to go three hourly out to 36 hours. And that that's mainly for the TAF issuance and the ability to go out to the full length of the TAF. Uh, it also will produce um, three and six hourly, um, 12 hourly elements for POP, QPF, and snow mount. And so for, I had to do something a little bit different for the predominant ceiling height and the predominant visby. Um, during the blending process, one of the main problems is you end up with some models that are saying really low ceiling and other models might say a little higher ceiling and then you end up with something in the middle which really isn't what you're looking for. Uh, so what I've done is I've actually transformed those models by using the natural log. And what that does is that re it reduces that gradient and that difference. And so what you end up with is a much cleaner looking field and with more realistic values. So I'm going to mainly concentrate here on predominant height and predominant visby. And this, there's a lot, a lot of numbers here. And the main idea is what I'm looking for is to show the different weighting um, from the model. So you can see in the early hours, I put a, a much higher weight on some of our hourly and higher res models, such as the HR RAP and GLAMP. Um, as well as the adjusted lab, which is similar to GLAMP, except it's, um, it's, it's an adjusted model based off of the lamp station guidance, and it's adjusting the, the wrap model guidance. And so I, I weighted those a little bit higher in, in the early hours, um, well, overall, just because those were performing pretty well. And then as you get further out, you start seeing that there's more and more weight towards what the official is saying, and less weight towards those early models because they just don't exist anymore, and you end up with some, sort of more of the synoptic scale models that we see. So, um, and then I do this low-level wind shear, and, and this one was sort of, um, it, it, right now it's a little bit different than the way everything else is. All the other elements all have are all smart knitted through the GFE process, so we we have the actual element. In the case of low level wind shear, um, currently that is not being smart knitted. I'm, I'm planning on doing it, but currently it is not. So this is all computed off the cuff and kind of short. So what I do is we only have winds for most of the mo for the models that are used, which are RUC 13, NAM 12, GFS 40, and then the two wharfs. Um, at around 1,000 feet and 2,000 feet. And it's really an approximation. I'm taking the 0 to 30 millibar above ground level height and the 30 to 60 and approximating. And then I actually do a further approximation by interpolating between the two. And this was all developed almost identically to what Boston was doing with their low level wind shear calculation. And so the difference here is I'm blending multiple models in an effort to to give weighting towards all of the different models. And then I will do a further interpolation to make sure I have hourly guidance. So now I guess we're going to sort of get into the verification side of the house. Um, one of the things we felt strongly with is how do we're putting together all of these gridded data sets and how do we know exactly how they're doing. We have an idea through the TAF verification program, but you know, it's that doesn't quite answer all the the questions about how we're doing. So I went down the line of trying to create a gridded verification and the first step to do that is to create a decent um verifying op. 
And so we've had mat jobs all CR. It's the central region version of what Tim Barker has done for quite a while. And what I did is I added the predominant ceiling and predominant VSB to that as well. In this case, since the, pre, the way it works is, it, again, it's a blending technique. So I take three to four model first guests, which in this case are RAP, RTMA25, HR, and G-LAMP. And I do an analysis on each, each one of those as a first guess, so as a background field. And then afterwards, I blend all of those together to come up with what the final answer was. So once again, after I did that, I was seeing gradient issues, and where one model was thinking one thing and another model was thinking another thing. And even with the analysis, it's really tough for it to analyze how analyze the field when you have these huge gradients because you could put a METAR observation of, say, you know, 250 clear skies over where the model might be just right next to it thinking that it's not clear skies, and it's going it, it, to, it, believe me, it blows up the analysis. So what I did again here is I transformed those fields and using the natural log, and then afterwards I will take the expo exponent of that to bring it back to what the field should look like. And that really cleaned up what the observation looked like. So I'm just going to show a quick little example of what the observation looks like. Here's a recent case of where we had snow pretty much throughout the entire CWA. Marsh is going to get into a little bit more detail about this particular case and forecasting it. But right here I have circled where our METAR sites are, TAF sites, and um, just sort of keep an eye on that. What you've seen here is uh, for Madison, there's a 17 um, foot, well not 17, but 170 foot ceiling. And um, I'll, I guess I can just go on just so we, for sake of time. So let's go show it what the OBS grid says. So here again, you see right away Madison sticks out with 17. And these are in hundreds of feet. So, and then the Waukesha op here, um, that one was, I think, about 100 feet off. And then, yeah, 100 feet, so it was 700 um, versus uh, the 800. And then Milwaukee was at 15 versus 13. And then um, down at Kenosha, um, we have a 7, and then the ob is saying a 7 exactly. So two of the four sites were exactly right. And this was a huge improvement for what we had been seeing prior to when I was doing the natural log. They were usually off quite a bit. Um, and so we're starting to feel a little bit more confident. And this is pretty typical. They're usually within 100 to 200 feet of what the actual METAR is saying. So uh, now getting into what I did with the verification. So this is all developed based off of what we did with Boise Short. and. Um, and this has been installed, I guess, now for about a year and a half or so. And instead, normally with Boise Short, you use the official database. And I ran into a little bit of an issue. I had to actually use the forecast database. It's sort of a minutia detail, but it was just a way that I could save the, the, save the forecast at the TAF issuances. So I'm trying to save a different official database, essentially for right after the TAF is issued. And so it's saved at 1Z, 7Z, 13Z, and 19Z. And then the model cycles, they're, they're all pretty much offset by about three hours. And I did that just so we're being fair to the models and fair to what, you, what the forecasters would actually have available to them during the time of issuing the TAF. And so, and then the adjusted MAV and the NAM12, they're, they're always time linked about six hours. And then what I've also done is I, in order to get a, a good feeling about how it's doing, I actually accumulate all four TAF cycles throughout the day. So I do a, a one day TAF verification. Uh, there, when you're dealing with elements that don't happen all the time, like the, the super low VSBs and the super low um, ceiling heights, it, you need to accumulate m multiple data in order to get a good picture for what is going on. So I do have the web page here, and, and you know later if we have time, we, I can actually get more into the web page. Uh, it's very similar to the current web pages you have. The the big difference here is um, actually where I have the edit area selection. It allows you to select 
um, multiple edit areas. So what I did is I have one where it's almost a point verification directly over the, the METAR sites. Uh, so if you don't trust what's going on with the, the actual OB, the METAR sites are usually pretty darn close on the grid. So I've added that as a way to do multiple types of verification. And what I'm using for the, the stats, again, are very similar to what's in the, um, the QPF verification, uh, which is high key, the percent correct. And um, I've actually changed that from threat to an equitable skill score. So let's go on to the next. Uh, the other thing when you're dealing with these kind of categorical type events is you need to learn about contingency tables. Um, so this slide is basically trying to give some quick examples for how how contingency tables can really help you out. Um, I I don't know if I'm gonna if I have time to go into it because I know Marsha has a whole lot of work, but as, you know I I can if we have time afterwards I'll get into this. Thanks, Jerry. We can come right back to it. But yes, if we wanted to move on, uh, I'll remember this slide. We'll come back. And this is sort of the same thing. I'm I'm just defining what what the percent correct is among the among that contingency table. So I, I, this is somewhat important, but um, I don't want to. It could take me a little bit to get into this. So it's here for everybody to see. Um, if there, and then later on, if we have time, I can get back to this. Okay, we'll also be sharing this presentation with, with everyone, so if you need to go back and read it more closely, we can do that, and we'll probably have some extra time at the end to go back and talk about more verification. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into the, how, uh, how the Milwaukee office approached introducing the aviation grids to the forecasters. So we kind of did uh, baby steps, if you will. Uh, Jerry did some background things, and he just he installed the aviation procedures, tools, and smart inits. They came from Boston. Uh, we we made a couple of modifications, but that's all, everything that's been modified is what he is going to be sharing with anyone who's interested, who's on A2. Um, okay, so after that. Or, or okay, so he installed everything. Then he got everything automated in the background. We we didn't even actually know it was running. It was up and running a month before they even they meaning like Jeff Craven and Jerry said, "Hey, we're ready for prime time on task ish on gridded tasks." We're like, "Oh, really? Okay." So they were, the grids were done in the background, automatically populated after 36 hours. And they were done with con short. And so, Jerry, you can interject any time. But uh, then also what was made was a, a TAF from the formatter launcher. That was done with these unmodified aviation grids straight from con short output. All right, so all this was running in the background, and eventually, Jerry and Jeff said, okay, now how about you check out the model? Check out what each individual model is saying. Like, what is D-LAMP saying for the, the ceiling height in the next 12 hours? What is the RUC saying for the ceiling height? What is the NAM and NAM Nest and, and NARI, all those models? So we, we would be preparing our tasks from the way we always did it in AVN FPS. And we could look at these individual models and it would help us decide if we think the ceilings are going to be low that night or if they'll come up. You know, you get the idea. Then, then the next step was, all right, now I want you to, I'm going to back up. The next step was also how, they said, okay, now I want you to populate the, the formatted TAF from the TAF formatter from GFE. 
put it into AVN FPS, and then make your edits to those tasks, and then send out your tasks. So this was actually a critical step. This turned our passive approach into a more active approach as forecasters, because what, what happened is that we, we saw from the, from the formatted task that we're like, oh, well, you know, I, I, could have, I could have better wind grids in there to make this task better, and, and I should. You know, my winds better match the task. And another thing, oh, you know, my sky cover, I actually wanted it to be broken and, and the task formatter came up with scattered. Why is that? Oh, my sky grids weren't bold enough or whatever. Those are all grids that we just normally do on a daily basis. This isn't even going into the ceiling and visibility grids. So this is what I mean by baby steps. This is a way that makes your forecasters realize, oh, I... I can add value, and it's just what I'm normally doing every single day, but I'm, I'm actually becoming more mindful of it, especially sky grids. Um, well, anyway, then, then we, all, we all got good at this over a period of maybe two, three months, and I, I kept getting after Jerry, take off the automation. I want to edit the grids, and I don't want it wiped out. I don't want all my work to be wiped out six hours later when Con Short runs again. Okay, so now uh, Jerry made a, a process where we we can run the, the we can populate all the aviation grids um, with any model we want. We usually start with Con Short just to have a good starting point out to 36 hours, and then if we if we choose, we can make minor edits to those grids. Uh, say Constort didn't capture the low ceilings because it was kind of being too averaged out by some of the models that didn't have the low ceilings. So then we would, you know, copy the G-Lamp model ceiling heights in, paste them in, just, you know, make minor tweaks. We, c we have aviation QC tools, and then you run the task formatter in GFE. You make some minor edits, and then you realize, or you realize your TAF doesn't need a whole lot of edits. Maybe you take out a line or two or change a little something, and then send it out. That's, that's actually the final, that's the final process. Are all the forecasters at MKX doing that? No, not everybody is yet. Um, so Jerry has something built in that every six hours, Conshort will run by itself um, automatically, and that's for verification. He can go into this a little more at the end if, if you'd like. Uh, but anyway, some forecasters choose to let Conshort populate for them before they take a look at the, the models and uh, do the edits and go through that process. Uh, some forecasters are letting Conshort be running in the background, not editing any grids yet, and they're starting with the TAF formatter and uh, in AVN FPS and editing from there still. So everybody's on different levels, but we do think this passive toward active approach, um, it, it works, and it took us about six months to get to where we are. And you know, a lot of forecasters in our office say, I don't want to go back to the old way of doing things. It's really nice that the tasks fall out of your grids. You don't have to decide if you want a new from group based on your winds, um, or, but winds primarily, but visibility, weather, anything. And this, this example task looks like a lot of lines. It is easier to delete lines than to add them, um, although occasionally it can get a little long in, in, in complicated situations. Okay, you, you've heard us talk about uh, different grids. I'm going to get into that at the end. There's predominant height and then the ceiling height, and then there's predominant visibility and there's regular visibility. Those are four new grids that are aviation grids, besides the low-level wind shear. Um, on NDFD, you can see that 
if you are in the hourly hourly section on the NDFD page zoomed into our forecast area, uh, Jerry enabled this in some way. Uh, you can you can see that there's ceiling heights and surface visibility, and we could mouse you can mouse through all of them. Uh, hourly weather graph is not I don't think that's quite available for our area our forecast area yet, but I think it'd probably be a flip of a switch because they're doing it in an eastern region, and um, this is taken from Boston, I believe. Uh, so it is, it, can, it is being sent out to NDFD at this time. We'll take a look at, at an example that Jerry started talking about where there was snow across the whole county warning area of MKX, that's all southern, almost all southern Wisconsin. And that was at 6Z on the 1st of February during a, a big snow event with primarily easterly winds, some lake enhanced snow, as well as synoptic snow. The vis general visibility was one to two miles over the whole area with ceilings in the 700 to 1300 foot range. So what I wanted to do with this presentation is show you how the con short predominant height um, did and then compare that to what I was seeing for the other models all at the 60 time period. First and foremost, when you go into a situation of making paths from grids, like I alluded to earlier, you have to make sure your sky cover is is uh, what you want. And your sky cover, you have to kind of know the formatter. And the formatter determines sky cover based on a, a simple table. So if you want scattered clouds, you have to have your sky cover in the 26 to 60 percent. If you want your tap to say overcast, you better make sure your sky cover is greater than 87%. Um, make sure your winds are the way you'd like them. Is there gonna be a lake breeze? We have to be concerned about that at, at uh, several of our tap sites. So we're very mindful of the wind shifts. Make sure your pops are the way you want it. The tap formatter is very sensitive to your pops. If you have less than 55%, Pops, it's not going to put any weather in the TAF, although it could put VCSH if it's somewhere between 46 and 55 percent. This is all just kind of practice, getting to know your formatter. Um, we do have a document that is almost ready for prime time if, if, uh, that we'd be happy to share with you that kind of highlights some of these things. Your weather type is also very important. Uh, it, it's important for obvious reasons, like rain or snow. But also, let's say you just want BR in your TAF. You'd say, oh, it's 3SM BR, um, like on a morning light fog case or something. You would never think to put fog in your operational grids. I think a lot of forecasters kind of use the rule of one mile or less. It's worth mentioning to the public. Um, we got to change our thinking a little bit for aviation grids because you're going to have to put patchy fog in there or something in order to have BR into your task. Anyway, then we do have a, cool, a tool called Aviation Finalize that kind of wraps up any changes you've made to your grids. It'll interpolate missing grids and, and uh, do some QCs. It's, it's a useful tool. All right, so for that presentation that Jerry showed earlier, you have snow over the whole area, we've got east winds, and some IFR conditions. All right, the, the OBS grid that we were talking about earlier, that uh, Jerry can populate all the observations in there, and it's, it actually has a nice picture across the whole area in between the, the ASOS and AWOS sites. Now, if you look at con short at, the, at 6D, this is the grid you'd see. And I guess you ask yourself, is this representative of what I wanted, what I want in the grid? And 
if you don't think so, all right, well, let's let's edit the grid then. Um, this construct would actually be up here in the in the forecast section of you can modify this using your hourly or using your weather browser. Anyway, you you all know how to edit grids, so it's important to use your grid editing skills to make your forecast. Um, so you can use your select area tool, you can copy other forecast grids in, use your pencil tool if you absolutely have to. You can delete intermittent grids and interpolate later. And the one thing you need to know is you only have to edit prevailing ceiling height um, for your pred height. So if, if, you're, if, if you're thinking like on a cumulus day uh, and your cloud bases are gonna be at 1,500 feet, you would just draw in a 1,500 foot ceiling for the whole area your sky cover is going to determine if it's broken or scattered. So just remember that. It's, it's not actually as big of a, a deal as you might think. I'm going to step through these quickly. The HER model is, this is what the HER model said. Notice from what is happening, the HER model is maybe a little bit more pessimistic up north, actually, and down south, more pessimistic. The G lamp seems to have a pretty good handle on it, maybe a little more pessimistic. The RAP is very pessimistic, meaning much lower ceilings than what are being observed. The NARI is a very, very optimistic. The NAM nest has like no low ceilings at all, hardly. The NAM 12 is pretty low, but not too far off. The high res wharf ARW is extremely low, saying 100 foot ceilings for most of the area. High res wharf NMM, extremely high. There's no IFR, MVFR anywhere. Adjusted MAV is, is on the lower side, although not too bad. Adjusted MET, a little bit higher. GFS 40 is um, on the low side. And then I just wanted to throw in one visibility grid just to get an idea. If it was there, did Con Short show you one to three mile visibility? And it did. It did a pretty good job. All right. So you, this is that aviation finalized I was talking about. It interpolates the grids. It it makes your aviation or it makes your uh, pred height, predominant height, which you're editing into your ceiling height. It takes your predominant visibility and puts it into your visibility. Um, and this it does applies a few quality control tools. One one thing to mention is that your TAF formatter uses your pred height and pred visby grids. The NDFD gets your ceiling height and visibility final grids. That's just kind of a good thing to know. I talked about knowing the formatter. And then it is just a matter of practice for becoming more familiar with aviation grids and using them on a daily basis. Some people want verification of how the new process is going compared to other, the old process. Well, Jerry showed you a way of show, seeing what our grids were doing. But what I did was ran some statistics through the performance management website of, of our TAF from the office collectively over a three-month period, October through December of 2013 versus 2014. <coughs> Excuse me. 2013, we were not doing the gridded aviation process, and in 2014, we were. The zero to 30 hours the whole time period, look at the blue lines, you can see that the probability of, of detection increased after using the gridded aviation. <clears throat> the false alarm rates decreased. That's the red. It's a similar trend for the particular periods of a task, 0 to 6 hour, 6 to 12 hour, and 12 to 30. 
12 to 30, we didn't see um, improvement actually. But I think if we did this in the next few months, I think we would. Uh, we have some, some reasons for that, uh, probably because of the recent adjustments Jerry's been making to the con short. <coughs> Jerry, I'll let you go ahead and, and handle this. I'm going to get back to my, my uh, operational proving ground course, but other forecasters at the MKOC, MKX office are available if you have questions to know about how it works in operations. So go ahead and ask questions after Jerry's done. And Brian's still here. And I'll step you through, Jerry. All right. So uh, one thing I just wanted to comment on, when Marsha was sort of running through uh, all those models for that individual case, I think that highlights the, the power of blending. Um, there were models that were all over the place, and how do you know, how do individuals uh, you know, choose exactly what model to use? And I think that that's where using and starting from a blend really, really helps this process. Um, per, you know, forecasting these gridded um, predominant ceiling height and gridded visibility it's tough work and there's no doubt about it and the models you know the individual models they all have their positives and they all have their negatives and i think if you take a blend which you know doesn't subjectively care about that it's just going to blend it together um i think that's where you're really going to get a lot of benefit um so now one other thing that we've sort of been working on here um, at MKX is to try to provide a little bit more information to the aviation community. And this is sort of a, a aside from the the ceiling height and, and visibility initiative, but what we're doing is we're actually creating these hourly graphs when we have um, bigger events. So this is a, an event that we had just a couple weeks ago um, where we were forecasting pretty much between um, five and eight inches throughout most of our CWA, and especially the, the southeast part of our CWA, we were expecting a lake enhancement, so um, that we had much higher amounts down that way. So wh the way these were created is we're actually creating, just creating six hourly QPF and snow amount grids just like we always would. And the, di the difference here is um, I've created a tool, it's a, and it's a weighted fragmentation tool. So rather than just simply fragmenting the six-hour grids and saying it's going to be the same amount throughout the whole period, I'm weighting the, the grid based off of what is in the con short grids. So where the con short is showing more precip, it's going to weight, the, um, weight that precipitation higher in those hours. And it's, it, it actually performs pretty well. Um, the, the idea here is the end grid, the end six-hour grid, um, or hourly, to some of the hourly grids are the same, um, but it's just weighting it towards when Conshore thinks there might be more s snow or QPF falling. Uh, these grids aren't in the ISC currently. Uh, they, they're just used strictly to, um, to, to, pr to produce these images. Um, they're called QPF one hour and QPF or in snow amount one hour. Um, we actually also do this for ice accumulation, but we haven't had too much ice uh, here, so I can't we can't really show that too much yet. Um, and then there's a separate tool to that, that actually generates the images. Um, I'm in the process of getting this out into the SCP as I am with a lot of the aviation tools that we've talked about, but um, this is just something that we wanted to sort of throw out there as another idea for extra DSS. So you can skip to the next slide. And then this is where I have hosted a lot of the installation documents. Um, if you click on those links, uh, once you get this document, you'll notice that the CRESTF tools actually don't have anything aviation just yet. Um, I'm in the process. I, of doing that right right up until the point we had the call uh so that it's it's right there it's, it should be there within the week um the the matabs all i just updated today it now contains the the 
most recent additions for the Pred Height and Pred Visby that will hopefully improve the overall analysis with the transformation. Um, and then the same thing goes for the extended tools. Uh, that, that's where you get the adjusted products for the match guidance suite. So here's just a clickable link that you can go to the wiki pages, and and this is mainly meant for all Ellipse 2 sites. And I think that's pretty much it. So if we have questions, um, feel free to fire away. I'll do my best, and we have MKX staff here as well. Okay, well, thanks, Jerry. And uh, we did lose uh, Marsha here, um, but what I wanted to cover uh, real briefly is uh, really following up on what Marsha set out. Um, it is and it is really intimidating to say the word intimidating, but it's very intimidating to say um, we're going to start aviation grids. But what we have here is what we've been looking for, which I think is how do I start? Well, where would I begin if I wanted to? And, and so what Jerry has outlined at the very last slide here in this presentation is the start. Um, we'll send this presentation out and it gives you an idea as to what web links to take a look at, what would have to be installed, um, what some of the smart tools uh, do. That's, uh, that's all coming. As Marsha um, hinted, she said she, she doesn't quite have it done, but she's working on it. Um, the, you know, we're just working together here and trying to provide uh, everyone with a possibility of how this could be done. Um, there's nothing that's mandatory about doing this, but for many of you, you have questions. You say, well, I wonder how this would work. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, Milwaukee chose to come forward and and say, well, okay, we can share a little bit. Here's what we have. And, um, you know, I, I tried to draw them out, and I know a number of other offices um, have been working um, on similar scenarios in AWIPS 1. Um, the, the difference here is that uh, we're all moving over to AWIPS 2, and um, uh, Jackson, um, I believe, with their installation on Tuesday, I believe Jackson is now the, or pardon me, on Monday, I believe they are now uh, just putting us over 50% in terms of uh, folks who have uh, AWIPS 2. So, I mean, we're, we're reaching that really important point where more of us now are going to be on AWIPS 2, and this is a, a real possibility as your ITs start to uh, uh, maybe see the end in some of their heavy lifting to get geared up for A2. And um, I think when you look at this, it, it, it's not that intimidating. It's just um, where do you start and here's a path. So um, I'm going to open it up now and ask if anybody has questions for Jerry. And if you don't have questions for Jerry, do you have any questions for the forecast staff? Jerry, who do you have on in, at Milwaukee who's working the floor today? Uh, it's Steve Davis who's a lead and uh, J.J. Wood, who's a general, both are were among the very first people to adopt the process and were very receptive to it. So I think they're excellent candidates for questions. All right. Well, I appreciate you guys. This is kind of impromptu. Um, Marsha's lunch slid a little bit, so we tried to um, uh, have a little bit, uh, uh, some, you know, maybe another uh, uh, another set of uh, folks who could answer questions. So I appreciate you guys. Um, someone has a question out there. Please go ahead. Um, Jerry, this is Goodland. Uh, this is probably a silly question, but what is the uh, NARI data they said? We don't, I went out and checked our AOPS. I don't think we have it here. It's coming down the pike. It's uh, uh, the North American, American Rapid, Rapid Refresh, refresh Ensemble. Uh, Ah, okay. That's, so it updates yeah. hourly, and it goes out to only about 12 hours, and it's coming via the Central Region LDM. Okay. Thanks. That, was, that really had me stumped there for a bit. Yeah, it's it's now part of the LDAD Model Manager, 
and it's also part of the latest um, standard in its config uh, build. Okay, thank you. I um, thanks for sharing that, Jerry. Uh, I did send that email out to the aviation focal point list. Hmm. I'm going to say it was it was over the holidays. Let's say it was November, December timeframe. Um, that that data is available, and the, the NARI provides um, uh, just another look at uh, you know what what uh, the aviation fields might be for ceiling and visibility. I will find that email and I will send that um, uh, that information along with uh, uh, this material uh, by the end of the day today. Great question. Anybody else? Hey. Hey, uh, this is John at uh, St. Louis. I just wanted to jump in uh, real quick about the, the NARI data. If, uh, if anybody wants to look at it on the web, it's actually available as a, on a web viewer. Uh, if you just uh, Google N-A-R-R-E, I think it's the first link that comes up there. It's, it's a big, nasty link uh, or a big, nasty URL that I wouldn't want to read here on the uh, <laughs> On the call here, but it's it's uh, it's available on the web. It's, I've been looking at it for oh, it's been maybe a couple of years now, uh, and it it does a pretty good job. Uh, I, I've been pretty impressed with it. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, I've been aware of it uh, for probably about a year myself, um, but uh, like I said, at least for the last three or four months that um, that it's been available. Um, via the LDAT, so great. Anyone else out there? Um, hey, Brian, this is uh, Dave here, Jackson. Yeah, Dave, I have. Ahead. I had a question if there was any talk of, of creating like a, a temporary uh, set of grids like for tempo groups. Uh, for uh, ceiling and visibility. I was just curious if there was any of that uh, being developed currently. I'm not aware of it, but uh, Jerry's probably a better uh, one to talk to. I know he spent um, some time uh, touching base with uh, uh, with Boston. So Jerry, what, what have you heard? I'm sure they've thought about that. You know, I, I honestly, in the conversations we had, it was never brought up. Uh, but that's a very good question. Um, I'll see what I can find out. Okay, thank you. And Dave, let, let me just ask. I know uh, we lost uh, uh, Dusty, who who had been um, also on this, and and probably about um, oh, it'd be over a year ago. But uh, we had him on the on on this call, and he offered what you've done in Jackson for many, many years. Um, did You had nothing um, like that in terms of a tempo group uh, before when you were in AWIPS 1? No, not not currently. It, it would be it would be sort of like a uh, one hour period in our grids and then uh, it would, uh, the formatter would assume that that time period was a tempo group, but there was never a certain uh, separate set of grids to uh, put in for like a, a, a tempo group. Okay. It's Rich in uh, Green Bay. I got a question. Um, did it require any shifting of duties? I could see maybe if one forecaster has the first, say, 12 hours and does these aviation grids and someone else does the remainder. That might be doable. The way we have it now is one forecaster does the first three periods and the other one does the rest. That seems like it might be too much of a workload. Um, this is JJ over at Milwaukee. Um, yeah, we uh, we did uh, shift some of the duties around a little bit. Um, the uh, aviation person is kind of the short-term desk and we do um, we do the tasks we do, and then we also do the first two periods, so the first 24 hours of the of the grids themselves, um, and uh, and some other duties. And um, we've we've experimented with shifting some of the duties around to some of the other positions, uh, like our, our uh, near shore marine forecast update we do in the morning. We shifted it over to the long term desk to, to give the 
short-term does some more time in the morning uh, to, to look at the aviation grids and the short-term grids themselves. Um, and, and we shifted a few other duties around too. So um, to give the short-term desk uh, some more time to, to focus on the grids and the aviation grids. Thanks. Anyone else? I'll add a little bit on workload. I know that central region offices are so much farther ahead when we take a look at doing aviation grids. I guess we can't appreciate how big a change this would be for, and I'm not gonna name regions, but uh, other regions that don't um, uh, participate in the, uh, uh, the uh, enhanced short-term uh, grids. And the, the uh, your wins should already be pretty good, and you should already be tending to the, the grids um, uh, now. And so I, I think that this allows you to see what's in your grids in a different way, and perhaps in a, in a more condensed way. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I only visited with, uh, with Marsha here the last two days. Um, uh, about this directly, and and that's one of the things that that came across to me was that um, by composing the TAF, you would see, well, why is there an extra wind group in there? That doesn't make any sense. I don't think that's going to be what it'll be. And you go into the grids, and sure enough, it, it there's something in the grids that that you wanted to modify. Um, so there there are little details like that where. Uh, it, it sounds like, oh my gosh, I have to go into the grids to fix the grids to get it to say what I want. I didn't get that sense, and, and certainly the operational forecasters uh, at Milwaukee, I want to hear from you, but I got the sense that more often than not, you, it, it provided a little bit of feedback on what your grids really say to the outside world, um, perhaps just because it's a more condensed forecast, and it triggered making those small changes that you might have made otherwise. Um, and, and then when those changes were done, the, the TAF actually said what you intended it to say. So is there anything that, um, uh, JJ, uh, is there anything you would add to that or, or do I have it wrong? No, I, I, I would agree. I would agree with that. Um, you know, again, it, you know, doing the TAFs uh, right from the grids, um, personally, uh, yeah, it does. It certainly makes you, you know, with the with the ESTF process, um, it certainly uh, makes you concentrate more on on changes, you know, in the in the TAF groups um, and changes in your grids that can have an effect on that. Um, so it does make you look at it more closely. It has for me. Um, and overall, uh, just my perspective on the whole process uh, and the result. Um, the thing I like most about the whole overall uh, aviation grid process is um, you're not, you know, before we would be writing tasks by hand in AVN FPS, we'd be looking at the models, then looking back at what we're writing, then looking at the grids, looking back at what we're writing. You know, there was all this back and forth, back and forth, and, um, you know, when it's a real busy situation, um, you know, you want to be keying on the most important information and maybe not just, uh, oh, I got to make sure I have this wind group right or that ceiling right, whatnot. Um, so having to do it this way uh, through uh, through the grids, you know, if you get everything in there that you like, um, ceiling wise, visibility wise, wind wise, weather types, uh, whatnot, um, and then uh, run the formatter and then uh, generate a, a TAF, and then yeah, you might have to do a little bit of post editing with the TAF as Marcia showed in one of her uh, slides earlier. It might be a little long, but again, it's much easier to take a a, 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 peri a, a TAF line or two out versus adding stuff in and it, it really it really makes the process a lot easier and a lot less hectic and stressful, especially in a busy situation like a snowstorm or something like that. Um, you, you know, you, you get the grids that you want, you get the tasks that gener that show what you want for the most part, and uh, you do a little post editing and send it. And actually, you know, I had thought initially this would actually take a longer period of time to do, and actually I found that um, it's actually saved me time because it allows me more time to look at the models and to look at my grids and to see what I want 
and put that in there, and then the process of actually creating the TAF itself and, and, po and editing it, you know, um, takes actually a shorter period of time than it used to. So that's the thing I, I, I've liked most about the whole process. This is, uh, this is Patrick up in Bismarck. We have a handful of our forecasters who are doing it, myself included. Uh, we're still on A1 going A2 in uh, late April, but I, I second what what, uh, what JJ has said. Um, you know, it really is a big time saver because we're, we don't have this discontinuity between doing grids and then doing something by hand. Uh, it just is a natural process, you know, as we uh, have moved to the CSTF uh, methodology. Um, and the post-editing, you know, I guess you have to have reasonable expectations that it's not going to spit out this perfect TAF with absolutely no edits. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's not a reasonable expectation. And like I said, it's easy to delete uh, a line or two that's uh, here and there than it is to, you know, to, uh, to kind of do it the old way. So and we, you know, we run, you know, uh, with uh, the short-term guy doing three periods, and I found that we really didn't need to adjust our any shift duties at all. It, uh, it was, you know, like JJ said, it's a time saver and it really fits naturally into this whole ESTF methodology. And uh, really, you know, from what we have, you know, experimented with with a handful of our forecasters before we spin everyone up on A2, um, it's it's a time saver and just kind of fits naturally in with the grids and the way we do things. All right. Well, thank you, Patrick. I appreciate you adding that. Um, I know a number of you have uh, been working with uh, A1 solutions, and it, it just seems as though A2 is moving along uh, much better, much faster now. And again, I'll, I'll be calling uh, David at Jackson this week to find out, is it truly moving along better? But it sounds like it is. Um, and so as we're doing that, uh, this... Uh, uh, set of uh, instructions and uh, tools that uh, Jerry and Milwaukee have put together is, is something for us all to look at, perhaps. Um, and I'm just going to use JJ's words uh, uh, and, then, and then finish the sentence. He said, what I really like about this solution, but I'm going to change it and say, what I really like about this solution is somebody from headquarters didn't come up with it. Um, what I really like about the solution is that uh, we've had um, four or five local offices working on their own way. This happens to be the AWIPS 2 way, but what I really like about it is I, I, I have some faith that when you get this out of the box, it will um, work and it might be useful to you. Um, rather than somebody at headquarters coming up with it, and sending it out to you and saying, here, I think this will work, but there are some known bugs, and here they are. You know, we don't know of uh, a whole lot of problems with this right now. Um, maybe it will get installed somewhere, and, and there will be. But for right now, it looks like this is actually a solution that you could take out of the box and look at and see if you want to try it. Um, again, I'm just recommending that, you know, Here's an option. You can, you know, go a different way, or you can decide not to do it. But um, I'm just happy to pass along tools that might help. In the same way as I'll make sure I get the email pulled back uh, for you. It is uh, just past the top of the hour, so I'm going to ask for um, any additional uh, comments or questions or alibis that anybody would like to provide. Um, uh, any anyone? Hey Brian, this is Jamie over in Chicago. Uh, for A1 solutions, even though our A2 in installation date is rapidly approaching, if you need yeah. any tools or anything, we've kind of automated the process. Not as not as fancy as what Milwaukee has, but it's working for us. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you want to know more about that, I can let you know, and I would love to know what Jackson is doing as well. Absolutely, and when I uh, set up our first call sometime back in July, my vision of it was that we would have an A1 and an A2 call, and and, and we would all try to do it that way. Um, the solutions now seem to be, um, well, I, I must say, 
uh, I thought headquarters was going to tell us this is the solution. And I, I do need to also say that we were promised that there'd be some sort of um, uh, formatters that were coming from uh, GSD uh, in, in Boulder, and they were going to provide us with this. I haven't seen those either. Um, I think we may be best off uh, working with what Jackson has, uh, what, what Bismarck's working on, um, Chicago. I, I, I know Jamie's done a lot of uh, work there. Um, so the offices that are A1 or have A1 solutions that they're porting to A2, um, feel free to you know send me what you have, and uh, I'll I'll make sure that that gets out as well. Um, I don't know what the right thing will be. I don't know what the final answer will be, but I know that that uh, we have a number of offices that have locally come up with an answer, and they seem to work. So, uh, any other comments? And this is uh, Mike from Aberdeen, real quick, and I, I apologize if this was covered already. I kind of stepped out, but so we're approaching our uh, A2 install in May. So will anything be baseline with A2? I guess that will probably be two builds ahead. But is anything planned to be baseline, or is this something we're all going to have to grab um, after the fact? Thanks. Great question. Jerry? Yeah, there's no chance it's going to be baseline. Um, there's, yeah, th this would be something that much like how, I mean, if if you wanted to go down the road of how we've done it, I have everything available on the SCP through those links. Um, so just like with how a lot of the post-install instructions are set up, um, you could just basically apply those same that same logic to the aviation style tools. For what it's worth, Jerry and uh, uh, Marsha um, set ours up here at Central Region. And um, so within uh, within a day, we are not there yet, but we're almost there. I had one more thing, and I know that uh, uh, Jerry sent an email to us um, saying, I think it works now. So i, I got to run over and, and take a look. But that is, uh, that is pretty short. I haven't been out there for hours and hours working on it. Um, it, it, it it's very approachable in uh, in the amount of time, and uh, Jerry has been very gracious in saying that um, you know, your uh, ITO can reach out to him, your GFE focal point, um, what you know, whatever uh, whatever you have, um, and he'll be honest with you about how much time it takes. All right, thanks. Appreciate the info. Oh, great question, Mike. All right, um, we are past the top of the hour. We are an hour into the call. I'm going to go ahead and call it going, going, gone. Um, when I hang up with you, um, my hope is that we will have a successful recording of this. Um, either way, I'll send it out here at the end of the day along with um, the, uh, the actual PowerPoint slides here, or I guess it's a Google slides, but I will be sending that out. Uh, can't thank you enough. Um, please keep in mind there's A1 and A2, as Jamie said. And uh, so uh, more about this is to probably send me an email, Marsha an email. Take it as well.